Who could have known that spending one day at a market could be so exhausting? Ah, uh, right. Just put all the things that we purchased anywhere, really. There's a lot of space here, so it's fine. Seems like people outside are still celebrating life, as always. <laughs> anyway, you can make yourself comfortable and get ready to fall asleep if you wish. No, I'm not sending you all the way back to the pheasantry. There's plenty of room here, you can stay. And if you don't mind, I'm going to take a look at these torn out pages that I bought from this sketchy merchant earlier. There are some notes about the northern realms, especially about the greatest cities, Novograd and Oxenfurt, as well as some information about monsters, and some short stories. I think this will be interesting. And if you don't mind, I could read these out loud. And then perhaps you can ignore the noises from outside. Alright. Where to begin? Pearls of the North, Navagrat. No one can claim to have travelled the Northern Realms who has not been to Novigrad. If I were forced to list what during my many meanderings has made the greatest impression on me, it would precisely be this great and yet at the same time free city. A metropolis worthy of the Empire, its only flaw that the civilization Nilfgaard carries within her has not yet enlightened it. That is why hordes of reactionary cultists of the Eternal Fire dwell in the midst of its excellent buildings and superb commercial infrastructure. One feels as though superstition is how the local hierarch and his temple guards cement their power over the city dwellers. And many they are to control, for the city counts no less than thirty thousands of inhabitants. While strolling through its fabulous port, Surrounded by marvels of architecture, it is hard to imagine that centuries ago, Novograd was a mere minor elven town. When the city fell into the hands of the Nordlings, its problems grew exponentially. For, as is well known, the people of the North can do a great many things, but peaceful and orderly cohabitation is not one of them. And so, Novograd first belonged to Redania, and then fell under Temerian rule, until finally, after endless compromises and bargains, it at last became a free city. But is this city truly free? I dare to doubt it. Redanian influence makes itself felt too strongly on every street corner, and the fact that the city is located within Radovid's territory speaks for itself. While wandering the city streets, I came across four water mills, eight banks and nearly 19 pawn shops. 
There are also a great many houses of simple pleasures, such as taverns and brothels, and Novigrad's commitment to matters of faith is borne witness to by the fact that the city contains no less than, I kid you not, 19 temples to the internal fire. What more can be said? I think Novigrad has all the markings of the capital of the world, and perhaps that is what it'll one day become. First, however, someone needs to bring order to within her walls. Reading this makes me want to see it even more. I mean, despite the coldests of the eternal fire. I want to see the architecture. And I want to see if I'm able to tell where exactly the original elven town was. Now let's hear about Oxenfurt. Oxenfurt, a gem snuggling into the bosom of the Ponta to the east of Novigrad. A cradle erected upon Redanian soil, nurturing the greatest minds not only of that kingdom, but of all the north. To walk its hallowed academy's halls is to embark on a journey through learning, from the finest points of philosophy to the grandest strokes of art, with stops made to admire architecture and dissect medicine along the way. Peer to either side, and you will spy fellow travellers in your pilgrimage of learning, the students. They throng Oxenford streets, lending it an indelible imprint of youth that can be felt the moment you pass through its gates. Dormitories stand cheek by jowl, booksellers hawk use tomes on every corner, and under every tree, fresh faces debate poetry with passion. Yet, youth is not all slate and compass, as the youth here shirk none of its other typical pastimes. Raucous and merry are the city streets, both by day and, even more so, by night. Though the city councillors have forbidden the sale of alcohol after dusk, no one seems eager to enforce this with stricture. And wisely so, for any loss of sleep is more than made up for by gains, profits to fatten its innkeeper's pockets, and the late night crooning of troubadours to enrich its soul. Yet, dominating the town's architectural visage, like a glistening crown, is the complex of buildings that compromises the Oxenfort Academy. Few today remember that these edifices, constructed by the elves, predate the city itself. It is the institution that named the city, not vice versa. Today, Oxenfort Academy enjoys a reputation matched only by the Imperial Academy of Nilfgaard. Of greatest renown, the departments of alchemy, natural history, minstrelsy and poetry, medicine and herbology, engineering, and last, but certainly not least, philosophy. It 
If we do go to Oxenford, we have to pretend to be students at least for one day. Please. I want to take the entire experience all in and it sounds mesmerizing, doesn't it? To be among all these great minds. Let's see. What else do we have? Oh. Right, that headline looked very intriguing to me. I had to buy this. Oh. I will read this to you, and I think you will very quickly notice from what perspective this was written. A portrayal of the elder races. What is a non-human? The answer is simple. As the very name suggests, it is something which resembles, and yet, nevertheless, is not a human. Though it walks on two legs, speaks a tongue similar to our own, and dresses in similar attire, it all the same has more in common with base beast than noble man. Dwarfs are like moles. They feel best underground and avoid direct sunlight. They like to live in filth, forever smudging themselves in mud and slime. They love everything that can be found within the earth. Rocks, metal, minerals of all shape and color. It is also said that, like their kindred moles, they feed most readily on worms, roaches, and other night crawlers. Halflings, for their part, are more reminiscent of gophers. Fat, lazy, and loud in that typical rodent way, their minds are filled with only thoughts of food and drink, which they steal from other, nobler beasts and greedily scrawl away in their hovels. They are marked by a cruel craftiness. You could be howling from poverty, and they could be swimming in gold, and yet they would still fleece you to the last crown. You could do nothing but good to them, and they would still stab a knife in your back. Elves, in turn, seem related to the birds of prey that dwell in far-off Zeracania. They care most for colored feathers. They would most readily spend all day staring at their reflection in the water and singing their own praises. Their appearance, unquestionably pleasant to the eye, is highly misleading, for they are cruel, and any who judge them by looks alone they first dupe and then kill in cold blood. The best proof of this? The so-called Scoyatel, bandits that claim to fight for freedom, but in truth only long to kill humans. All these vile, so-called elder races, are, to a great fortune, slowly dying out. Joy fills the heart of every right-thinking man at the thought that his great-grandchildren will never know them, that in their day dwarfs, halflings and elves will be mere fairy tale characters used to scare young children. Well. I don't know about you, but I have a slight feeling this may have been written by a human who also happens to worship the eternal flame. Just a feeling.
You seem to be slowly falling asleep. That's good. I don't take that personally. But there is one short story that I want to read out to you. I've heard only good things of it. My evening with a vampire. You will no doubt call me a liar, a cheat and a madman. You will shake your head in pity and snort in disbelief. But I promise you, I swear by all the gods, everything which you shall read in the pages that follow is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I met the vampire of which I write years ago, in an inn in Beauclair. He introduced himself to me as Regis and said he was a barber and a medic. Since he looked in every aspect like a mortal man, I might never have even suspected his true nature. Had not a fire broken out shortly thereafter in the establishment in which we were residing. This Regis, if that was truly his name, stood completely untouched by the flames, whereas my own clothing quickly caught fire. The vampire carried me out of the burning inn, saving my life from certain death, then treated my numerous wounds. At first, Regis refused to answer my query as to how he had survived the furnace-like temperatures inside the burning inn without so much as a scratch on his body or a hair singed on his head. Eventually, however, he must have sensed I was a man of the world, one who would not jump to hasty judgments based on appearance or species, and revealed his identity, along with a great number of highly interesting facts. According to Regis, not all vampires are alike. The vast family contains both mindless catechins, fleetus and achimaras, who in form resemble overgrown bats far more than humans, as well as alps and brooksae, who look remarkably like comely mates. In addition to these, there are the even more powerful, higher vampires, to which genus belonged my unexpected acquaintance. Not even a witcher can discern a higher vampire from a mortal man. Contrary to popular belief, they cannot be killed by pounding aspen stakes into their chest, nor by cutting off their heads, nor, as I can vouch for based on personal experience, by fire. They do not fear running water, garlic, or the symbols of any creed. It might be some consolation to learn a vampire's bite does not turn a human into one of their number, and they do not, in any way, need our blood in order to survive. To them, it is merely a delicacy in which they indulge from time to time, like men do with fine wine. Regis asked me to keep his tale to myself, but now, as I lay on my deathbed, I feel that I must share this secret knowledge, even if it means breaking my word to this most noble individual.